Thanks. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Awesome. Um, yeah, so my name is Lon uh, Ingram, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about performance, like Dave said. Um, and specifically, I'm going to be kind of giving, um, I'm telling you all a little bit about what I've learned over the last uh, few months working on optimizing performance for a large uh, third-party JavaScript app. Um, so I work at a company called Bizarre Voice, um, and we do uh, ratings and reviews across a huge swath of the internet, um, uh, including uh, big label clients like um, Best Buy and, and others. Um, in particular, we specialize on, in um, e-commerce, right? That's our core market. And the, the value proposition that we offer our customers is that um, these ratings and reviews uh, drive purchasing decisions. Uh, and this is not just an advertisement. This actually feeds into the talk. Um, and so what's, what's really important for us is that we get our um, content quickly onto the page um, so that we influence that decision. And if we don't influence the decision, then maybe our customers aren't getting the value that they're paying for. Um, and so specifically what I work on is um, the team called Firebird. Firebird is a um, single page uh, backbone app. And it actually renders the ratings and reviews in the page. Um, and this is kind of a tough problem. So basically, we're like running an entire single page app in someone else's website. And we're not running it in an iframe. We are literally running it in their page, in their DOM. Um, and that entails like a great deal of trust on the part of our customers. They, they depend on us to get things right, because if we screw up, we could break their entire website. And um, for large e-commerce uh, websites, that breakage could be measured in thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars if it takes us long enough to fix it. So we take that very seriously. Um, another thing that's important to note is that, uh, as many of you may know, um, render time, specifically the time it takes for a, a page to load, uh, is directly associated with um, conversion rate. In other words, if your page is slow, it's going to cost you actual dollar money. And um, our customers track this very carefully. So we do a lot of stuff to stay off of the critical path of rendering, so to make sure that we don't slow down um, our customer pages. Um, but we still have to be fast, because if the user makes a purchasing decision or decides not to purchase before we manage to render to the page, then we haven't influenced that decision, and we're not providing the value that we are promising our customers. So um, the organization of this talk is basically uh, that I'm going to give a sort of um, my one weird trick for performance optimization, which is to follow a rigorous and uh, careful method. And uh, then I'm going to do a, a, a case study of uh, some network optimization that I did uh, earlier this summer. So what is performance optimization? Um, the way I see it, at, at its core, performance optimization is about resources. It's about recognizing that you're using resources inefficiently. Uh, resources include things like the CPU. For example, if your code is slow, really what you're doing is you're um, not using the CPU efficiently. Or maybe you're not using, using memory efficiently. Or maybe you're not using the disk efficiently. Um, it kind of depends. So you identify those inefficient uses of system resources. You come up with some ways to improve it, right? Um, it's definitely an art. There's just a huge, broad range of things you can do at any one moment in time um, to improve or try to improve the performance of your web app. And uh, picking which thing to do is actually really quite difficult. Um, so the, the art of performance optimization is sort of knowing where to look, knowing how to choose um, the values that you try first. Uh, but it's also a science. Uh, if, you're, if you're not careful and rigorous with how you do your uh, performance optimization, then you're going to have a hard, uh, really, really hard time because um, you're going to change things in ways that you don't understand. You're going to break stuff, uh, and it's going to be really frustrating. Um, so the sort of the major activities of optimization, uh, the way I see it, is that, is that you, you first you got to set some goals. Um, you have to come up with an abstract understanding of your application, uh, and I call that modeling, or I don't call that, lots of people call that modeling. Um, you need to instrument your, your apps so that you get some actual real world data, both um, in the lab when you're doing synthetic stuff, and also from your users in their um, real world users in their browsers. Um, using the information that you get from, from these three parts, you're going to identify some optimization opportunities. And then what you really want to do is you want to design an experiment. You don't want to just make a change and then see what happens um, you know, with your users on the live site, or at least that's not the way that we approach it at Bizarre Voice. Um, what we do is we actually try to design an, a, 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 a scientific experiment or scientific-ish experiment, run that, and then um, analyze the results and then decide what to do from there. So let's talk about setting goals. This is, I mean, this is the first thing you, you got to do, right? Like if, 
it's, it's really hard to start anywhere else other than to say, like, this is where I want to go. Um, an important thing about goals uh, is that they've got to be attainable. Um, we had a client who, uh, you know, contacted us and said that, you know, we think you're not fast enough. Uh, we really think that you should be able to uh, render uh, reviews in the page within 30 milliseconds. Um, and this is just a totally unrealistic idea, right? Because the actual, like, just the latency to download our file from um, Akamai is going to be often higher than 30 milliseconds. Never mind actually running any JavaScript or doing anything to the DOM. So that's, that's just a total non-starter. So you've got to set attainable goals. Um, the next thing is that goals shouldn't be arbitrary. It shouldn't just be um, optimizing things to optimize them. Um, unless maybe you're, you're John David Dalton and you're working on Lodash, in which case, go for it. Um, and and that's, <laughs> that's not actually arbitrary, right? Because Lodash is used by um, thousands of, of, uh, of websites. And so when he makes a, a small 1% improvement in the speed of, say, map, that directly affects lots of people because people are running map a lot. Um, but that's not usually the case with your app. Um, so you, you want your, 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 the choices that you make about performance, they need to be driven, uh, they need to be grounded in reality and they need to be grounded in business requirements um, or perhaps in the, the experience of your users, what, you know, how they actually experience your app. And the reason for that is, is basically just so you don't waste a lot of time optimizing something that doesn't actually matter to anyone because optimization is slow, it's expensive in terms of um, developer resources and demonstrating that value to uh, the, your, your boss and your boss's boss uh, you need to be very careful about making sure that you do that or you're going to get pulled off of it and put on something else. Um, finally, uh, your goals have to be measurable. If you can't measure what you're doing, it's not real when you're doing performance optimization. You need to be able to tie actual numbers to the things that you're doing. So, sorry, math is a requirement. Um, okay, so the next thing you need to do is develop like an abstract understanding of your web app. The details of applications are so uh, complicated that really you, you have to take a step back at a higher level um, and not just do that, but you also need to tie it to a sort of mathematical representation. And what that means is you need to figure out what are the variables that contribute to the performance of a particular thing that my app does. Like in our case, what we're gonna talk about later is um, downloading uh, our application uh, JavaScript and CSS um, and rendering it in the page. And so what are what are the things that affect how that happens, the things that I can affect, and the things that other people control that can affect how long that takes? Um, and you build up basically uh, an equation. That equation, you plug in your values, and out at the uh, other end of it comes a number that tells you how the prediction of that model for how long it's going to take to complete the operation. Um, the thing about models is models are not real, right? They're abstract. They don't truly represent reality, but that, that doesn't matter. And in fact, that's maybe a good thing in a lot of cases because reality is very complicated. Um, good models allow us to make predictions about uh, the world. Uh, and those predictions are you know, perfectly precise, but they're good enough for us to make decisions. And so we'll talk more about that later. Uh, the next thing you need to do is you need to instrument your app. Um, so what does instrumenting do? Uh, instrumenting basically means you need to be actually gathering real performance timing data um, in your application. Uh, and that's the first part, is the gathering of the data. And then the second part is to actually report that back to uh, your server somewhere, or someplace where you can access it and analyze that data. Um, for gathering the data, I really like the user timing API. Um, it's it's nice in a couple of ways. Number one, it provides um, sub-millisecond precision, which is, uh, if, if you've ever done this sort of work before, that's a really nice thing to have. We didn't have it for a very long time, which meant that if you ever tried to measure anything that was less than a millisecond, the browser would either report one or zero, and just really not very helpful. Um, the other thing that's nice about it is, is that it's, it's pretty well supported cross-browser, uh, with the exception of um, Firefox, I believe. Uh, and it's also really easily polyfillable. So there's a really good polyfill out there for it, um, and I'm linking to it from my slides. Uh, and so you can, you can pretty much deploy this with all your, all your stuff across all browsers and start gathering data, and it's, it's really nice. The other thing that's really nice about it is that um, the good developer tools out there are keyed into user timing, and they actually will feed the data that you gather um, into their visualizations and their reports. So in, in Chrome DevTools, for example, um, if you uh, measure some duration in uh, using the user timing API, it'll actually show up on the timeline tab uh, in, the, in the waterfall diagram, which is really helpful. Um, the other one uh, like that is Web Page Test, which is a, a server-based performance analysis tool, which is really useful for analyzing um, 
how fast your web page is going to load. Um, it's not as useful for us, for, um, uh, for Firebird, because a lot of the things it talks about have to do with the initial page load uh, of, the, of the host page, and we don't have a whole lot of control over that. We just sort of like get injected into the page at some point. Um, but what's nice about it is that it, it actually listens for user timing API data and includes it in the report that it generates. So the next, the next step is harder. Um, that, and that's actually getting that data from your application, from the user's browser, to some place where you can um, have a look at it. Um, the reason this is hard is because it's often the, your requirements are very specific to your needs. Um, there's sort of three broad ways to go about this. Uh, there are fully hosted solutions. Google Analytics is um, probably the most well-known one. You can definitely emit custom data to Google Analytics and, and graph it with all the other stuff that you get um, through that system. Um, Splunk has a hosted solution. Uh, Splunk is really nice, uh, particularly if you're going to be emitting um, like errors and, and log, logging to, uh, to the server, because Splunk will integrate that stuff together. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can self-host, um, and there's some cool off-the-shelf uh, software that does this. Uh, a really good example is StatsD from um, Etsy, uh, and that's just a system that's designed to take UDP performance timing data, and it generates, um, it sends it to Graphite, which is a way to, to generate um, time series. Um, the bummer here is, is that you have to host it yourself, right? Like, they don't have a, they don't offer a hosted solution because they're in the business of, um, you know, shipping macrame and stuff like that, and not in hosting um, these sorts of things. Uh, which means that as your app scales, you're going to have to scale your, um, your, your analytics uh, stack with it. And that turns out to be a really hard thing to do. Um, and I know that because at Bizarre Voice, we actually have our own analytics uh, platform that we have developed in-house. Um, and it's, it's awesome. Um, but it's, there's a full team that works on it um, all the time. And it's, it's a really, uh, it's a full-time job for them to keep that thing up with the uh, load that we place on, on, uh, on our servers. Um, so you really, I, I can't, I'm sorry I gave you more specific guidance other than you got to do this. Um, I would start, if, if I were you, I would start with the fully hosted solution. And then if that doesn't work, then uh, move kind of down the list with Roll Your Own being the last thing I try. So the next step is identifying optimization opportunities. Um, this is, again, sort of like, this is really where the art comes in. Um, and there's just a, a couple things I can tell you about it. Um, one is, uh, you want to look for the places where your application is spending the most time um, in, in whatever part you're trying to optimize. Because uh, if, for example, you know, you have, your application takes 600 milliseconds to render, and you identify some part of it that takes 20 milliseconds um, out of that, uh, what did I say, 600 milliseconds, you could make that part that takes 20 milliseconds a million times faster, a 1 million x improvement. Um, and what Amdahl's law says is that you will only speed up your total uh, time by at most 20 milliseconds. So it's probably not, not worth your time. Um, or maybe it is, and that's the other thing about Amdahl's law that's kind of rough, is that a lot of times, particularly in mature applications, there isn't some like huge bottleneck you can identify and take care of that and make everything twice as fast. Instead, there's lots of little bottlenecks, and you just sort of have to prioritize them and tackle them one after another, which takes a lot of time and can be very frustrating. So. Um, the other thing is that as part of identifying these things, you really need to prioritize things that uh, you have an idea of how you might be able to fix. In other words, um, you really need to, 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 to look at the, the, the different opportunities that you have and then just pick one that you really think you could actually tackle um, in some, some reasonable amount of time. Once you've chosen that thing, it's time to design an experiment. Um, and this is just the experimental method that we all learn about. Um, in, uh, in, in school, uh, you, you, you ask a question. So a question might be, um, if I cache the intermediate results of a particular calculation, will it make anything faster? Then you form a hypothesis. The hypothesis is of the form like, caching the intermediate results of this calculation will reduce uh, the total calculation time by half. And then you test it. You design an experiment, which basically means you, you try uh, you run it a bunch of times uh, without doing the caching. You run it a bunch of times with the caching. And then you compare the results. Uh, you analyze the collected data uh, and see if any actual improvement was made. And if an improvement was made, great. You fixed a problem, it's time to move on. Um, a good experiment uh, is, number one, focused. And what that means is you should be trying to only change one thing at a time. Because if you change a lot of things, then it becomes really hard to know what actually caused the effect that you're seeing. So if at all possible, you want to change exactly one thing. 
Um, and the other thing that's uh, a good experiment is, is repeatable. Um, and at a minimum, that means you need to document what you're doing, maybe in a text file, um, but ideally in a script, so that you, know, you can say like grunt perf experiment one, two, three, and it'll run 15 trials or however many it is and spit out your results. Um, that's kind of further down the road, and, and we're still working in, on getting there Bizarre Voice ourselves, but it's definitely a good ideal to have. Um, the, final, the final step is analysis. Um, and this, uh, this is also a sort of um, vague uh, area, but I'll, I'll, I'll cover uh, a little bit of it. Uh, one important thing is that perf data usually doesn't conform to uh, the standard distribution, which is that bell curve that you probably have seen in school. Um, where you know you have like a smooth arc, and in the middle is the mean, and then you have standard deviations that tell you about how much data is under a particular part of the curve. Um, and there are a few reasons for this. Um, one is just that 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 distribution is uh, often not found in nature, um, and another is that perf data. A lot of perf data is is multimodal, meaning that you might have a bell curve, but it's it's being superimposed on top of another bell curve of a different shape centered someplace else. Uh, and the result is that the final curve doesn't look like a bell. Um, the, per the, the classic example of this is um, users hitting your website with a cold cache or a warm cache. If their cache is warm, then their render time is going to be much, much shorter because the browser is just loading files off of the hard drive instead of making a network request. Um, but there's not really any good way to distinguish between those users from JavaScript. Um, so your analytics are just going to report some uh, 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 metric that lumps all of these users in together. And so the, the end curve is not going to be as helpful. So what do you do about that? Um, when you're doing perf analysis, the best thing to do is to, is to use um, stats that are independent of that, of that curve. Um, specifically, the minimum is very useful. The maximum is very useful. Um, the median, which will be uh, in, the, in the case study we're going to do in a sec, we're going to talk about the median a lot. The median says 50% um, of, the, of the sample data is lower than this number and 50% is higher than this number. And so you know, what you can sort of think about that is like half of my users will have an experience as good or better than this and half will have one that's worse. Um, similarly, there's the 75th percentile, which is 75% is lower and 25% is higher. Um, and then uh, usually you pick one in the 90th, 90, 95, 99. Um, and that number is really useful because that tells you what the worst case is going to be like, right? So um, it's not any good, uh, or well, I don't want to say it's not any good, but uh, if you have a median that is at a particular, you know, like 200 milliseconds, for example, um, then that's really good. That means that half of your users are going to have less than 200 milliseconds. But if, say, your 90th percentile is um, 30 seconds, that's not so good. That means that one out of 10 users on your website are going to wait 30 seconds for the page to render, which means they're not going to actually wait, right? They're going to go someplace else. Um, plotting the results is really helpful. There are some good tools for this. Uh, I use Excel a, a lot, um, for, particularly for ad hoc analysis, and it has uh, pretty, pretty nice graphing. Um, uh, also, LibreOffice Calc, of course. Uh, Newplot and R are both really useful, um, and particularly if you get some automation in, into, your, um, into your experiments, then this can be really cool because you can actually run, you know, grunt my experiment and then uh, have like a plot come out the end of it, which is really cool. So um, once the analysis is complete, uh, it's time to begin the process again. Um, and what, what that means is, is that, um, you know, this thing is a cycle. It's, it's like the old joke about what do you do when you're uh, finished painting the Golden Gate Bridge? Well, you start painting it again because it takes so long to do it that you know you got to you got to do it again immediately, um, and that's the same thing with with, uh, with uh, analyzing the results of your experiment. A lot of times, your experiment will teach you things, and that means you you need to go back and you need to maybe adjust your goals or refine the model that you're using. Um, it may tell you that your instrumentation is needs some tweaking. Maybe it's too coarse or it's too fine or you're, there's a blind spot in your uh, instrumentation. But either way, you adjust and then you go back to the beginning of the process I just described. So um, now that we've sort of laid out the, the method, let's actually see how it works in practice. Um, uh, and so what we're going to talk about is the render time in the Firebird app. Um, and this is basically the time it takes from uh, our app starting up until we render ratings and reviews in the page. Um, so first, let's talk about the application architecture. Um, it's a statically served single page backbone app. Um, it's hosted on S3, and it's edge cached on Akamai. Um, 
And the way that our users, our customers, excuse me, actually integrate with us is that they, in, they include in their page uh, a script tag. Um, and that script tag goes to a canonical URL uh, referred to that, that downloads a thing we call the, the scout file. And the scout file is a small JavaScript uh, script. Um, and it's cached for a short amount of time. And among other things, what it does is it injects um, a link for the styles that we're going to use, and it injects a script tag for our actual application JavaScript, which is much, much larger, um, on the order of 230 kilobytes gzipped. Um, and it fetches that from a versioned URL. So um, when we release a new version of our code, that version changes. And so what we do is we cache that URL, or we tell the browser to cache that URL, essentially indefinitely. So it's like three years. Um, and the cool thing about this architecture is that it gives us a really nice trade-off between being able to unilaterally push out updates and fixes to our code. Um, at most, the user is going to have to wait 10 minutes to get a new version of the code when we push it out. And uh, it does pretty much the best we can to optimize for the user having a warm cache when they hit our page. Um, so uh, when the application JavaScript comes down, then it renders the ratings and reviews in the page. There's also a, an API request out to our platform that happens. Uh, and I'm not going to go into details about that, mostly because it sort of muddies the, water, uh, in, muddies the waters with respect to this model. Um, so let's just ignore it and assume that the data is already there. So what's the problem? This all sounds really great. And, and in reality, it is. The, 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 the design of Firebird laid like a really good foundation for um, for having a high-performance uh, single-page app. Um, and, and it does that by having this minimal number of highly cacheable requests. But as, so we, we got that in place. And then we started adding features. And the focus was very much on building the app out and adding more and more features to it and, and providing new functionality to uh, our customers and our users. Um, and performance was not prioritized. And as a result, over time, the render uh, time sort of crept slowly up and slowly up and slowly up. And so when I started it at uh, Bizarre Voice in the spring, um, my lead, Rebecca Murphy, asked me to take a look at this. And so that's, that's what I did. And uh, we're now going to sort of talk about what happened next. Um, so first, we set some goals. Um, the, the, mean median, or excuse me, the median render time at that back then was, let's say, around um, one second, uh, which, which isn't great. Um, a lot of times we were waiting for the API requests. A lot of times we weren't. Um, and so we set the goal of reducing that render time uh, in the near term, uh, the near to moderate term, um, by 5%, which works out to about 50 milliseconds. And it seems like it should be easy to attain, but it's actually it's pretty tough. Um, and in the long term, we set a much, much more aggressive uh, goal, which was to cut our median render time in half. Um, and that's more on the, on the order of a, a year from now. So we got a goal. Let's talk about a high-level model for Firebird itself. Um, basically what happens is that we have, there's sort of five phases to the render, the render, uh, to rendering Firebird. The first part is we wait, uh, is the time until the scout file actually runs, or excuse me, is requested by the browser. And that's a thing we don't actually have any control over. Um, and, and that's something that's going to come up with y'all when you're doing uh, your performance optimization as well, is that there are going to be parts of your model that you won't have any control over. In this case, we don't have any control over it because this process happens when our customer's website injects the script tag into the page. And it might do that in the, in the head. It might do that in, at the end of the body. Um, in some cases, they wait until the load event fires and then dynamically inject our script. Um, they, they do whatever they think is the best for their situation. And we offer guidance on what we think is the right uh, move for performance. But at the end of the day, they decide and we can't control it. Once that happens, the browser fetches the, fetches the scout file. That's another phase. The, the scout file uh, is downloaded and parsed and compiled and executed by the browser. And it then fetches the rest of the app. And then that, that's the next phase. Uh, and so it takes some time to fetch the application. Basically, we try and pull this thing down from the internet. And then finally, once the app is actually there, it's going to run for a while, do some JavaScripty stuff. And then it's going to eventually take the API data, run it through some templates, and drop a bunch of HTML onto the page. Uh, and that's the final phase of the render, uh, the render process. So today, what I'm going to uh, sort of really focus on is the, um, the fourth step, which is uh, uh, T app fetch, the time it takes to actually fetch the application. And so uh, this model I just outlined is really high level. It doesn't actually tell you anything about how any of this stuff works. It just lists a bunch of things that happen. So let's, let's make it a little bit more concrete. Uh, specifically, what we're going to talk about, we're going to right now derive a model for fetching a file, um, a, a, uh, 
fetching the rest of the application um, over the network. So I think we all have like, when we first start out, this sort of like intuitive model of how um, network requests work, right? Like there's like the size of the thing you want, and then there's the size of the pipe that you have that you're gonna pull the thing down by, and you basically just divide one by the other, right? Like I want this 100 megabyte file, I have a five megabyte per second um, connection, so it's gonna take me, what, that's 20, 20 seconds to download the file. And, and for large files, this actually is a, a pretty correct model. Um, but for small files, uh, actually, maybe not so much. But we'll, we'll get to that in a sec. So here's that model actually instantiated um, into a mathematical formula. We, have, uh, we specify the, the payload in, uh, as bytes with the symbol S, and the bandwidth in um, bytes per second is W. And the time it takes to download a file is um, the size divided by the bandwidth. Um, this is simple, but it's also like, it's really wrong. Um, bandwidth measures essentially how fast a sender can put data onto a wire to transmit to somebody else. What it doesn't measure at all is how long it takes that data to move from the sender to the receiver. Um, and that that's actually turns out to be a really key uh, uh, value, particularly for smaller files. Um, so our model doesn't account for this, which, uh, and what that thing is called is, is called uh, propagation delay or latency. Um, and it, that is the time it takes a message to travel from the sender to the receiver. And there are a couple important things about um, propagation delay. First, it approaches the speed of light. Um, and in fact, this makes a lot of sense, right? Because a large part of your, um, your packet's journey is gonna be over some fiber optic back end where it's literally light going down some um, glass uh, tube. Um, and the, the more important one from our perspective is that latency is a function of distance between the sender and the receiver. It doesn't have anything to do with how big the file is. Um, and so that means you could be sending a, a 100 megabyte file or a 10 kilobyte file and they're gonna have the same latency end to end. So let's, let's put latency into our model and I think this will start to illustrate a little bit better where I'm getting with this. Um, so we add a new variable P which represents the propagation delay between the client and the server. Um, and so the client is going to have to send a request for a file, and then the server is going to send back a response that is the file. Um, and so we have to pay that propagation delay twice. So let's, we, we plug that into our model. We now we have T equals two times P plus S divided by W. And let's actually work this out as a, as a real quick example. Um, let's talk about, we're gonna have a 40 kilobyte file um, for bandwidth. Uh, 21.2 megabyte or megabits, excuse me, per second, which works out to about two and a half um, million bytes per second, and a latency of 17 and a half milliseconds. I pulled these from uh, there's an FCC government report. I'll link to it in the slides. Um, and so what you end up coming up with is that it's going to take 50 milliseconds to pull this file down, according to our model. Um, and one thing that's important to note is that second to last line uh, on the left hand side, that's 35 milliseconds just of latency. So fully 70% of the time it takes to download this file is latency. It doesn't have anything to do with the bandwidth. You can make the bandwidth infinitely fast and it's still gonna take at least 35 milliseconds. But it's worse, right? Because we're not actually just like sending these files back and forth. We have to like, we're making an HTTP request and HTTP goes over TCP. Um, so what is TCP? TCP is a core network protocol um, its uh, inventors, Paul Irish and Alex Sexton, claim that like NPM, it doesn't actually stand for everything, uh, stand for anything, but we actually know that it stands for taking care of packets. Uh, TCP provides like a reliable connection, which means that um, every single, what the actual upshot of that is that every single packet has to be acknowledged. Um, and it offers a connection oriented uh, delivery of these packets. And what that means is that you have to set up a connection from your client to your server. If you're gonna send TCP for, between any two points on the internet, those two points on the internet actually have to set up a connection between each other and maintain that connection. And that connection requires some overhead, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, specifically, uh, the process of initiating connection takes a round trip to the server. So we have to send a message to the server, the server has to respond with another message, and now we have a, a connection. Um, so this thing is starting to get a little bit complicated. Um, we're seeing a lot more of these round trips, and so let's just refer to those by what most people call them, which is the call round trips. And that time is referred to as the round trip time, or RTT, uh, which is just two times P. Okay, so now we have a new model. Um, we, we're gonna need two RTTs to get this data, right? We got one 
round trip to set up our TCP connection. Um, and then we have another round trip to actually make the HTTP request and fetch it back to the browser. Uh, so this adds another 35 milliseconds to uh, the time that it's going to take to fetch this stuff, right? We've added one round, one round trip. A round trip is 35 milliseconds. Um, so now 82% of the time that it takes to fetch this file is uh, due to propagation delay. But it gets worse. So uh, the other thing that TCP does is it deals with congestion in the network. And it does this in two ways. Um, the one that most people are familiar with is called uh, uh, congestion control, which is that TCP detects that there's congestion in the network basically by, if it doesn't get an, an acknowledgement of a packet, then it assumes that that packet was dropped due to congestion and, it's, and it cuts how fast it's sending data in half. And it sort of keeps track of this thing called a window. Um, and that, that cutting it in half is called an exponential back off. Um, but that's not what I'm gonna talk about. What I'm gonna talk about is the other thing, the lesser known thing, which is uh, congestion avoidance. Um, and that is that during the very beginning of a TCP connection, the sender maintains a different window, a private, unadvertised window, um, and it limits, it artificially limits how much data it will send until it starts getting acknowledgments back from the distant end. This thing is called a congestion window, uh, or CWIND, um, and it's typically four to 10 packets, um, and so that works out to about uh, uh, 15 kilobytes on most, most computers. Um, and what happens is for each uh, acknowledge, so, so you send, uh, if you have a long enough, uh, enough latency in the pipeline, then, then the sender will s transmit 10 packets and then it'll wait for acknowledgements to come back. And each time it gets an acknowledgement, it'll increase its sea wind by two. Um, and the upshot of this is that every, essentially every round, every RTT, uh, you're gonna double your sea wind. So what does this mean? Like, why am I telling you about all this? Um, here's what I'm trying to tell you, which is that during your first RTT, your bandwidth is artificially constrained. Like, you could have a gigabit connection, but during the first RTT, you're only gonna get 3.4 megabits per second. Um, and the way that I come to this number is you're sending 15 kilobytes, and you're waiting, uh, and you're, that's the most you will send during that first RTT, and RTT in this case is 35 mil, uh, milliseconds. You divide that out, you get 3.4 megabits per second, uh, which is about 16% of the available bandwidth from my example. For large files, for long connections, this doesn't matter, right? Like this is just the first few uh, milliseconds of request and who cares? But for web apps, we care because almost everything that we do is during the early part of a connection. We're requesting a bunch of small files or maybe only a few slightly larger files. But either way, we're not gonna be doing a whole bunch of round trips to the server. And so Slow Start can have a real effect on, our, um, on how long it takes us to download uh, our stuff. So let's refine our model even further. Um, so if we uh, add in the idea of this um, C wind or, or congestion window and we define that in bytes uh, as C, then we can find the number of round trips to download a particular payload of size S using this formula. Um, and I don't want to go into where that formula came from. I asked a buddy of mine who's a math PhD to help me figure it out. Um, and so uh, that tells us the number of round trips it'll take to download a particular um, payload of, of some size. And now we, we update our model to say, okay, it's now gonna take us um, the round, the, time, the RTT, so how long it takes a round trip to occur, times one round trip for the connection setup, plus R round trips to download the payload, plus you still have to pay for the time it takes the uh, server on the other end to actually put data on the wire. So let's take a look at our example again. Um, let's set C to 15 uh, kilobytes, which is fairly normal. Um, and if we do this, then we can figure out that, that it's gonna take two round trips to fetch our um, our payload instead of the one that we were thinking it was gonna take us. And if we put all that back into our model, we're gonna end up with 120 milliseconds to fetch a 45, uh, or excuse me, a 40 kilobyte file. And 87 and a half percent of that time is because of latency. Um, so now imagine that your latency is higher, that you're over say a mobile connection, right? This is why latency is so critical to web performance. And really, you don't actually have to pay much attention to bandwidth at all. So again, let's, let's talk about how realistic this model is. It's not, um, it's more realistic than our original model, but there's still all sorts of things going on. The internet is like really super complicated, it turns out. 
Um, and there's like lots of proxies and routers and all sorts of things going on. Um, and and there's, they're all playing games. They're all trying to optimize this thing in different ways. And sometimes the way these things uh, interact can be uh, kind of counterintuitive. But for our purposes, it's good enough. It doesn't matter. Um, it approximates the, the reality that we're trying to understand. Um, and, it, and we're going to use it in a sec to actually make predictions about what happens when we uh, vary some of these uh, variables. So let's briefly talk about instrumentation. Um, instrumenting network requests uh, is kind of tough in the browser because, particularly as a third-party app, you, JavaScript doesn't have a whole lot of access to timing data about um, requests for resources uh, other than the page itself, right? You've got the, excuse me, the navigation timing API, and that'll tell you things about how long it took to like, do the DNS resolution for the page and to fetch it down and, and all that sort of stuff. But that's not helpful for Firebird at all. We don't care about that. What we care about is how long it takes to fetch our resources, and that's not exposed in a cross-browser uh, manner. Um, there is a new uh, API called the Resource Timing API. Uh, it's available in some of the browsers, specifically Chrome, IE, and Opera, I believe. Uh, I think in Firefox, it's behind a flag. Uh, and, and that'll actually give you that data for resources. Um, there's some like cross-origin stuff that you have to like send the header down. But unfortunately, it's not available across all these browsers. And so um, what you end up doing instead is you know when you fetched your resource. So you start timing then, and then if it's a script, then at the very beginning of that script, then you mark the other end of your time and you say, all right, that's how long it took to fetch my JavaScript. It's really not, right? Because what actually happened was not only was a network request made, but then the browser had to parse, compile, and start executing your JavaScript. But it turns out that in most cases, that last bit is um, not a huge contributor to, uh, to, to the time it takes. And you don't really have a better choice. So you just got to kind of take it. Um, so let's go back to how Fire, uh, Firebird works. And if you remember, I said that what Firebird, what the scout file does, uh, once it starts running, is it, in, it injects a, a style link tag and a uh, JavaScript script tag that point to uh, the app styles and the app script, uh, respectively. Uh, it turns out that what we were doing is we were, um, what seemed totally reasonable, which is we were putting the, the, the CSS in first, and then we were putting in the JavaScript. Um, and so I said my one weird trick was going to be the, the like rigorous approach. This is actually the one weird trick. Um, it turns out that browsers reuse TCP connections, because they know that it actually takes some time to set these things up. Uh, and so if you request a file, the scout file in particular, um, from some domain, when you make your next request, that request is going to go out over the existing TCP connection. And the reason that's important is because slow start has already had one round, right? So we've already increased our sea wind. We have a higher sea wind uh, starting out for this next request. So the question that I asked was, OK, well, does it matter whether we request the JavaScript first or the CSS first? Like, is this going to make a difference? So let's ask our model. Um, we're going to start with the following. These are the values that I used when I actually did this experiment. Uh, they're different than the example, but um, it, it doesn't really matter that much. So uh, an initial C wind or congestion window of 14.6 um, kilobytes. Our bandwidth is going to be 5 megabits uh, per second, or about 625 kilobytes per second. And our round trip time is going to be 42 milliseconds. So in the status quo, we plug all this stuff in. Um, we expect that the CSS is going to get that existing uh, connection, and it's going to have a, an approximately 30 kilobyte congestion window when things start out. It's going to have a higher C. Um, while the JavaScript is going to get a whole new, new connection, right? Like, we're putting these th two things in. The browser had one existing connection to our server, and now it needs to open another one. Um, and so our model predicts that the CSS is going to take 156 milliseconds to fetch, and the JavaScript is going to take 617 milliseconds to, to fetch, which is quite a while. You start to see where the uh, one second render time is coming from. Well, let's swap these. What does the model say if we swap the order of these two things? Well, then the CSS is going to get the smaller uh, sea wind, and it's going to have to pay to set up the, uh, a new connection for itself. So it's going to take longer. In fact, it's going to take almost 200 milliseconds, 198. Um, but the JavaScript is going to get the already open connection with the already larger C wind. Um, and so it's going to take less time, 533 milliseconds, to fetch this stuff. Um, so the end result is that we, we expect the CSS to take 25% longer and the, uh, brow the JavaScript to take 14% less time. Um, so this seems like it might be a problem that the CSS time has increased. 
But the important detail here is that these two requests, once they're initiated, are in parallel. So it doesn't actually matter that the CSS, the CSS could take twice as long because it's still way less than how long it takes to fetch the JavaScript. And what matters is which uh, is the longer of the two, the maximum of the two values. So I designed an experiment, and uh, first we'll talk about the hypothesis. The hypothesis is what you would expect it to be, that injecting the JavaScript tag before the CSS tag will uh, decrease the amount of time it takes to fetch the application. Um, and here's the design for the actual experiment. Uh, I, I want to tell you guys a little bit about, this is the second design. The first design, I was actually trying to fetch these files um, across the internet, like I was trying to hit S3 from my laptop and running the experiment that way. Uh, and this turned out to be not very, uh, it didn't work, <laughs> it didn't work at all. Um, and the reason why is because it wasn't focused, right? Like, I'm, you know, making this request through the public internet, which is this huge cloud of like whatever the hell. and. Uh, and so there's a whole bunch of variables in play. And what ended up happening is that there was all this noise in the data that came back. And I couldn't come to any sort of conclusion. Um, so I realized, no, you got to like, do this locally in your laptop. So that's what I did. Um, I set up a web server on my laptop. And then I used a program called um, uh, Charles Proxy. Uh, there are other programs, uh, I believe it's called IPFSW or something like that. That's a command line program on OSX you can use to do this sort of stuff. But what I did was I throttled the bandwidth on, that, on the connections to that web server. Um, I set an artificial uh, latency on the connection, so you know basically Charles would hold on to each packet for some amount of milliseconds before it forwarded it on. Um, and, I, and I set the MTU, the, the packet size, to 1460, which is where that 14.6 uh, kilobytes comes from. Uh, I ran 10, 10 trials in Chrome uh, because I wanted to be able to use the, uh, the uh, resource, timing uh, resource timing API. Um, and here's what I got. So the status quo is on the left, swapped is in the middle. Um, and what ended up happening is that, as we expected, the CSS took longer to download. Um, it took, in fact, about 40 milliseconds longer, uh, or about 22% more. Um, and the JavaScript took a lot less time to download. Uh, it took about, uh, or excuse me, actually it didn't. <laughs> it took uh, a little bit less time to download. It took uh, 20 milliseconds less, which is about a 3% improvement. Um, which, if you recall, we were actually expecting a 14% improvement. So here's where we come to the analysis part of this whole thing. Um, what happened? Why? We expected 14, we got three. What, what did we miss? Um, so what I did was I used a tool called Wireshark, which is a network analysis tool. And I actually looked at the, um, the network traffic between Chrome and my web server. Um, and it turns out that Chrome does lots of clever things because it's from clever, clever folks. Um, and they, when they see that you're opening a, a TCP connection to some uh, domain, they will speculatively open some other ones, thinking that you're probably going to download more files. So let's just go ahead and pay the connection time up front. Um, and so what ended up happening is that the, the model was inaccurate. Like the, the, the second request didn't have to pay an extra uh, round trip to set up the connection because the connection was already set up. Um, so when you plug that in the model, you end up with 7% uh, instead of 3%, uh, which is a much more uh, reasonable uh, delta between the two. It's still like 50% off, a little bit more than 50%. Um, and so here's where sort of the next phase of analysis, the meta-analysis comes in, which is, what, is it worth the time that it would take to sort of drill down and figure out why it's uh, three instead of seven? Um, and also to try it in other browsers and maybe run more trials? Is it? Um, in this case, we decided not to. Uh, it turned out to be a really low risk change. I mean, we're just swapping the order of these two things. And really, all we cared about with running this experiment was to make sure that we weren't going to make things worse. Um, and once we established that we weren't going to make things worse, and in fact, we're going to make some modest improvement, we made the change, we shipped it, we moved on to the next thing. Um, and that's an important thing you need to think about when you're, e even if uh, we had shown the, the expected improvement, if there had been a high risk associated with the change, if, if you know, we were worried that it was going to break code on website, on, on our, our, particularly on our customers' websites, or it was going to break our code occasionally, then you've got to think about whether or not it's really worth uh, making that change. So that's pretty much all I got for you all today. Um, and the, the main thing that you want to think about with this stuff is that you need to be rigorous in your approach. You need to gather lots of data. You need to set good goals. Um, and, and you need to be continually thinking about how you can improve your performance. And I'll take questions if anybody has any.
That's a great question. So um, the question is, we weren't able to, I wasn't able to measure any difference in, uh, across the open internet in my uh, experiment. Since then, have we seen any, um, any improvement? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, unfortunately, the answer is we don't know um, because uh, at the time that we ran, that we shipped this code, we were, uh, there was a bug in our um, analytics code where it was not shipping, uh, it was not including the version number. So we were getting performance data, but there wasn't any uh, app version number tied to it, so we don't have any idea uh, whether or not this thing worked or not. Um, but again, it's low risk, and the, the model leads us to believe that it should have worked. So. Other questions? Come on, don't let them off that easy. Uh, I've got other weird stories I can tell if we don't have questions. Oh, I think please. I've got more time. Questions, please. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, what percent of your development effort as a team um, is geared towards these performance experiments? Are there specialized folks like yourself that are spending 50 or more yeah. percent of your time on optimization, things like that? How do you spread that around? That's a, that's a great question. The question is, um, what percentage of our team is working on performance? Or uh, alternatively, are there particular individuals who are focused on it while others are focused on other aspects? It's, it's the latter. Um, uh, I work for a sub-team called uh, the Tooling Support and Frameworks team that is focused on these sorts of uh, problems, solving um, uh, sort of non-product related um, engineering problems. Um, and I'm the main person working on performance. And uh, I would say that over the last, since I started in February, that's what, like seven months, uh, I spent about half my time working on this. This particular experiment took me about um, three days uh, to sort of derive the model and nail all the stuff down. Um, whether or not that's really a good payoff is debatable, um, but um, one thing we got out of it was the model. So we now have this detailed model, and, and I've only shown you a small part of it, a detailed performance model of how Firebird will perform. And that allows us, if we want to make other changes, to uh, make predictions about what's going to happen with those changes. Um, and the model has actually given us some other ideas about things we could do. Um, in particular, uh, we're looking at maybe breaking our application JavaScript into two files, um, since even though that would require opening another connection, it turns out that connection's probably already open. And uh, we may be able to download you know, the two halves of the files in parallel and cut our time uh, very substantially to download the two files. So that's an example of how things can pay off in ways you don't expect. Any other questions? Other questions? Don't be shy. I have a question, Lon. Yes. Um, you know, there's, there's studies that show, you know, response time and performance uh, make a big difference to companies that, are, that have products that are pro uh, profit related. So Amazon says that they can load their page faster. And I didn't know if you had given that, those stats in your talk. But is that, when you talk about metrics and whether it makes a difference, do you have some ideas or thoughts on how you would how you would make that argument? Like if somebody says, three days, why did we waste three days of time just to save a few milliseconds? Uh, yeah, so there, there are definitely um, a lot of studies that show that there's a direct correlation between um, how long it takes a page to load and render um, and conversion, which basically meaning the percentage of users who actually make a purchase on the page. Um, and so you can, you can make that argument for sure. In our case, it was a little bit of a second order effect because we're, uh, our, the value that we offer is, is to lift conversion, right? To say, like, you'll get better conversion because of this awesome user-generated content. Um, because people really do pay attention to reviews, and reviews generate, uh, or they, they, up, they, they uh, raise conversion. Um, and if we weren't being seen, then we weren't affecting that. But yeah, so that, that's the argument that I would make. Um, but again, that comes back to when you're uh, setting your goals, the goals need to be grounded in reality. And so at the end of the day, it comes down to what the business feels is a priority. Um, performance optimization is expensive. Um, one argument I would make is that it's a lot easier to do it at the beginning of a project than at the end of a project. Um, you know, Firebird is now a very mature app. It's a very complicated app. And so that limits our opportunities to do a lot of optimizations because a lot of them would be really disruptive and are scary from a testing and quality assurance perspective. All right, other questions? Oh, right, right here. So the things you're saying like to optimize, you're doing things like splitting up the JavaScript files, 
or uh, making those two files to download in parallel, those kind of things. Are they like standardized across the browsers or is there any plan to standardize that kind of behavior? Uh, so the question is, is there, uh, let me see if I understand. Are, you're asking, is there any plan to standardize sort of how the browsers download these files? And um, I don't believe, well, so the HTML5 standard um, standardizes how browsers need to uh, render, I believe, how they parse and then render the page. Uh, and so that, based on that, there are certain things that they just basically, everybody has to do it the same way. Um, but to, to answer your question, no. Uh, the closest thing to that will be the service worker API uh, that's being, uh, the spec that's being debated right now. And that would allow you as a developer to actually take full control over the process of downloading any and all files on your page that you wanted to. Um, but you, you basically end up writing a, uh, a, a worker that runs in a separate thread that's in charge of um, fetching the, dis deciding how to fetch the, the job, the, your resources. That's a really bad summary, go read about it. But um, in the present day, it turns out that most of the browsers do most of the same thing because they're all competing to see who can be fastest, right? Like browsers compete to be fast. And so they end up doing a lot of the same stuff, particularly around um, uh, networking because they, they all uh, are basically facing the same constraints. Does that answer your question? All right, last call. All right, thank you very much, Lon. Thank you.